Hey, everybody. I'm Mark Horner. Welcome to Horner's Corner. It's a pleasure to have you along. This is a place where we have conversations, share knowledge, uh, help each other, build a community, and all through the process, we aim to do it in a um, compelling and respectful way. And tonight, episode 11 of this weekly program, we have a very special guest, someone who I hold in very high regard. He worked in television news, both as an anchor, reporter, and very much as a meteorologist for about four decades, about 40 years. And he is Larry Rice. And Larry Rice is here in Washington State and joins us from his home this evening. Welcome to Horner's Corner, Larry. Thanks, Mark. Glad to be with you. It's a real pleasure. When I when I uh, think of you, I, I I guess I should disclose I also think of a friend because we worked together at KOB TV in the early two thousands in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But I always have this um, I don't know if it's a romantic notion, um, but it was about Seattle's golden era for me growing up and being a young man for television news because you were at the CBS affiliate at that time. 87 to 95 for you, I believe. Right. Cairo, Channel 7, the CBS affiliate. These were the days, of, let's see if I can get the right names for that time frame. You had um, you had Monica Hart, Brian Wood. You had Susan Hutchison, uh, Steve Rabel. Aaron Brown, I think, was in there. You had yes. Harry Wappler, a Seattle weather legend. And you had the one and only Mound of Sound, Wayne Cody. What a time to be working in Seattle in television news. And you were part of that. It was fun. It was fun. I, you know, you bring up uh, the mound of sound. Well, everybody, Wayne Cody, and it's sometimes I like to do his voice just to remember him. And uh, uh, heck, the last time I saw Wayne, it was uh, it was I had just moved to Albuquerque, and Steve had invited me to Phoenix to uh, attend one of the Seahawk games there. And I was up in the press booth and ran into Wayne and he wanted me to come over and actually be on Cairo radio with him. And I said, uh, you know, one thing led to another and I got distracted and never got back to him. And unfortunately that's the last time I ever got to see Wayne, but uh, I do remember his kind invitation and I wish I had taken him up on that. Well, he was um, quite a character. I used to listen to him on Cairo sports line. And my dad, in fact, would tell me that he remembers listening to Wayne Cody, I believe on KVI way back when. Um, but we used to listen to him on Cairo sports line on seven ten AM. And he would talk about his lemonade and vanilla wafers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard him say that, but I, that always stayed with me. I don't know why it stayed with me, but it did. And he had and his that, own restaurant and, and yeah. with his sticky buns. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and I'm going to probably get this wrong, but a lot of people who even outside of the Seattle market, if they if they follow news, have enjoyed news for the last two or three decades or more, they may remember the name Aaron Brown because he ultimately went on to both CNN and um, ABC News. ABC first. ABC first, then CNN. But now I'm trying to remember, was it King and then Cairo or Cairo and then King? I think it was King, Cairo and then King. It was King, then to Cairo. Had to uh, okay. sit out for six months because of back in the day, they had those non-compete clauses in the contract mm -hmm. that prevented you from jumping from one station to another. And then he was the 11 o'clock anchor for mm -hmm. many, many years. And the thing that I liked best about Aaron Brown is there was nothing pretentious about him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. There are some anchors who would ask you as the weather person, um, well, what are you going to talk about? So they feel like they want to set something up. Aaron Brown, just pfft, th there was no setup. He'd just be doing his you know, notes on his script and everything. And when the camera came on, he would turn to you and you had to be ready. You had to be on your game because he could throw a question at you and you had to come up with a decent answer. He's just, a, he's just a, an, an awesome journalist. Yeah, it was quite apparent that he wasn't somebody who was solely dependent on the script, that he no. was very comfortable off script and you could you got the feeling that you were with in his mind almost feeling the questions emerge and form and they were oftentimes usually very smart questions very smart indeed and he asked tough questions he didn't let anybody get away with uh, the easy softballs so no era is perfect and there's always room for improvement but what do you think made that time in television news um i don't know i guess maybe everything that's also uh, a bit rosier in the rear view mirror. We can romanticize about the past, certainly. But there was a whole lot of talent 
uh, at, in Seattle at that time, um, there was um, a high level, oftentimes, of journalism. I remember Mark Rolstad and investigative producer Mary Mapes. Mm -hmm. I remember this case, the story they did on a gentleman out of Monroe, Washington, who worked, who was accused of, I believe, killing uh, uh, a clerk. Uh, his name was Gerald Hansen, and their investigative work got Mr. Hansen out of prison. So, I mean, that's the level of journalism that we saw. Um, wasn't uncommon at that time. How would you kind of characterize what made that era special? It was unique in the sense that there were few outlets and they had top quality journalists. And let's face it, television, newspaper, radio, all depend on advertising. Advertising revenue is what helps pay the bills. And when companies can make a really good profit, they can spend money on really good talent. And that was really the key is they had the budget to do the right kind of journalism. They didn't have to cut corners. They didn't have to settle for mediocre talent or mediocre writing. And that's kind of where we've gone in the last uh, 20 years. It's, it's changed over to where the medium, at least for television, has turned into more of a hi, look at me, I'm on television, as opposed to, I don't care about the camera. I want to tell the story. There's a lot packed in there, but let's talk about something you said just prior to going on, when the, prior to this stream beginning. You talked about the profit um, that, for example, a Cairo would make and what, what a big piece of the pie it was then compared to what it is now. And there's no denying that there are competing forces with so many opportunities to look elsewhere for news or what we might con some consider to be news. Uh, lots of distractions, let's just say that, that there's, they're all around us and uh, always almost in, in our hand. So talk, can you kind of contrast the, the budget then versus the budget now, the profits yeah. then versus the profit now? I couldn't tell you about the budget um, because I'm not privy to those numbers, but I was told that back in the day, um, Cairo TV, for example, after all the bills were paid, that means you know the lighting bill, all the, the huge salaries that they paid the top talent, all the regular salaries from, from the president of the company all the way down to the receptionist, all the bills are paid, Cairo TV's owners were able to pocket about 49% profit. And that is a lot of coin. As, as you've probably heard the term, back in those days, television was a cash cow. And newscasts were where the, the television stations generated most of their revenue because they had to pay for syndicated programming. They had to pay, it, it turned out, you know, there was a time when the network used to pay the local affiliates to run those primetime programs and morning programs and all the stuff that came from the network, the networks paid the local affiliates, but it got to the point where that programming got so expensive that the affiliates had to start paying a piece to the network. And slowly that profit began to uh, eke away. And then along comes the internet and there's more eyeballs being distracted in other locations. You also have satellite. So you went from Oh, let's say I'm, I'm just coming off of uh, my ancient memory. The ratings for Cairo TV in, in a particular newscast might have been a 12 rating. And they might have only been number two in that time slot with a 12 rating. And I know there's a local station and I'm not going to name it. But when the news director put out the uh, we're number one in almost all of our time slots and all but one of them were a point rating. When I say point, they didn't even get a one. It was like a 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5. And that's how that's 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 their share. And yet they're number one with that because there's so many eyeballs elsewhere. So it begs the question, how are they hanging on and, and how long can they hang on? They're hanging on by cutting salaries. That's why you see in the Seattle market, you see the top names retiring or leaving, stepping down going to do other things. Typically back in the day, people didn't retire from television. They just, you know, you, you saw people in their sixties and in seventies with all of that great knowledge and, and, and gravitas to use that word, uh, able to anchor a show 
and be able to carry the ball and not even do it with a script. Thinking back, you know, in like think of a Walter Cronkite and how 52 years ago this week, he was the center of attention for all the eyeballs on CBS when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And today, there are very few anchors who could even uh, come close to, to filling those kind of shoes. Because it's like they, they, need, they need a script. They need to be hand-fed information. Something that, um, you know, I've almost felt like, <laughs> I don't know if I should say guilty thinking of it. I think it's kind of a fair assessment. There's no, in my opinion, um, arguing that the impact of social media and the handheld camera uh, and the contribution that viewers can now make to see their name maybe her, uh, mentioned as a text or even even vocalized on the evening news free for free, you know, are handing over their pictures and their videos. So 22 minutes to fill in a half hour newscast. Um, that's some of the low hanging fruit. And there's an act, you know, I always felt that that's a very active part of the mission these days, it seems for an assignments editor um, is to, is to get that stuff, to collect that stuff. Um, because, uh, you know, and, and there is an argument for it in the sense that, you know, somebody happened to be on the scene. So they got the flames before or the news crew showed up and everything was done and over with and everything's getting hosed down at the fire. So there is that, but there, it goes beyond that. It helps fill time and it doesn't cost oftentimes anything. That's part of why you see so much of this. We've got team coverage and they'll focus on all these different angles of one story. And it's like at the end of a 60 minute newscast, I've only seen this one story, albeit a big story, but you've ignored the rest of the day. The, the problem I have with producers in news today is everything has to be a theme. Everything has to, it's, it's not a newscast, it's a show. And I always despise that term. I'm not on a show. Mm. I'm not a performer. I'm delivering information. I'm not acting. You well, get that? Do you see what I'm uh, saying about that I, part I of it? I so get it. There's a part of it that resonates with me. And I, uh, I've, uh, I feel like the business has passed me by in the sense that I always thought we were supposed to be a window to a story and not a door that gets in the way. And even when we were in the business, consultants were really pushing hard for reporters in the field to do not one, but two or more stand-ups, mm -hmm. you know, the walk and talk. And, and so it was putting us up there. And um, I, I, that always... I didn't want to be that person in the way of the story. I wanted to show you and have you hear from others. Um, they, and and they, they push the exaggeration to the nth degree as well. You and I have seen enough young reporters go out, you know, when, when weather is the big story. And the reason why weather is the big story is not because it's important, is because it's so easy to fill that hole. You know what I'm saying? I can fill a big hole with a bunch of different weather shots. And it's like, I could literally pull up a bucket of scripts and say, all you have to do is just recycle these scripts and put in new dates, times, and places. The same words, you know, snow's coming down to beat the band out here. And, and it's, it's low visibility. And it, and times the reporters would be saying things like this and, and the conditions behind them were not. I can recall, oh, oh, I can't remember the name of the reporter, but they standing in Edgewood uh, sent him over to the other side of the mountains talking about how traffic is really horrible over here. The roads are really slippery yet. You see trucks and that just flying by at the speed oh, limit. I, and it's I like, it, so you're referring to Edgewood, New Mexico outside yes. of Albuquerque and Tijeras Canyon. And yep. the typical deal there was to kneel down on your knee at six o'clock and say it's wet it's wet right now but tonight it could turn to deadly ice real yeah cute. see <laughs> see that, that that was the other problem i had with reporters is they would say things that were absolutely incorrect yeah. because it made the story more important it's not bad now but wait till later yeah. and that really gets to the nut of a lot of the problems i have today is that news is trying to instill fear because fear mm. gets your attention when you mm. make somebody afraid of something they go oh what's that yeah. you know what's that noise what's that sound yeah. what do i have to worry about next and and that's not a way to attract viewers 
You know, it's, it's interesting. I see a parallel with YouTube or what makes a successful YouTube video or a channel. And it's the mystery. It's the, how's it going to turn out? And I think that's the same thing that you're addressing is there needs to be some sort of drama attached to it with a presumably unknown outcome that you have to tune in to watch and see. I'm reminded of being sent to Gallup, New Mexico to cover a massive storm that was allegedly coming in. And I learned on the way that it wasn't happening. I actually knew before the news, before I left the newsroom. And for those who don't know, the drive from Albuquerque to, to Gallup in good weather is about two hours. It's on the border of uh, Eastern Arizona. So on the way out there, I called dispatch in, um, is it McKinley County? I'm trying to remember. Um, and they told me, no, nope, clear skies, all stars. And our weather reports are telling us no concerns tonight. So I reported back to the news director and I was basically looked negatively upon for being a, not a can-do guy, basically. But I felt, you know, wrong chasing something that wasn't going to be newsworthy. And we could, I thought, better invest our resources. And, but, and you can always still cover that story. But what's wrong with going out there and saying, hey, we're out here in western New Mexico on Interstate 40 in the Gallup area. A lot of traffic going through here. But good news is you're going to be able to get through here tonight. And you shouldn't have any problems. The word from New Mexico State Police is these roads out here are clear. So if you do have to travel in this there area of western New Mexico, I've just conveyed important information. It's just yeah. not the information the producer wanted. <laughs> the producer wanted icy roads and cars oh. sliding off and tractor trailers jackknifing. Well, That's news as well. But you can have good news and still be conveying quality information. I, I, I will give you that. That's a very good point. Um, you, you made, you stated that weather is cheap to do and it sells fear, but if I'm not mistaken, I think I learned this while we were at KOB that according to the consultants, the number one thing that rates with viewers is weather. Thus WWW, the mantra at KOB, we win weather at the time. Mm -hmm. But uh, the argument I had with management there is I didn't want to go and cut into programming unless I thought the storm had the severity to warrant interrupting programming. And the problem in the day was the competition would do that. And I'm not going to mention names or yeah. stations, but nevertheless, because he's doing it, we should be doing it as well. As if people are doing what news directors do. They've got three televisions on and, and they're watching all three at the same time. And they go, oh, oh. Channel 12 is on the air. Why aren't we on the air? And it's like, if people are watching Channel 4, they're not watching Channel 12 and their programming is not being interrupted because there's nothing of importance to interrupt their programming for. So, Larry, this, this tug of war that you're talking about when the employer is asking you to do one thing that you don't have the conviction or belief in, how, how are you coming to a resolution where you can put your head on your pillow at night and live with yourself um, and I'm not saying it's as, as if you've gone out and committed a felony, <laughs> but still, um, journalistically and responsibility wise, which is part of journalism, how do you come to terms with that? And I would presume that you don't miss it. Well, I, I went head to head with station management time and time again and refused to be the, uh, to, to cry wolf. You know? did you yeah, this is this is this is a thunderstorm. It's producing some heavy rain right now. The arroyos are running very fast. It's not a severe thunderstorm, but lightning is always a danger. So anytime you see lightning and hear the thunder, you need to be indoors in a safe location. And I say it with a calm voice because there is a level of anxiety that is conveyed now to where even a lowly tropical storm in the Southeast is made to seem like it's a big deal. You know, 45 mile an hour winds are going to be whipping through New Orleans. That's like Tuesday in Forks in Washington in, in November. You know, that's just another day. Mm -hmm. It's not that bad. Other meteorologists who have since left the business are uh, still on social media conveying these uh, important uh, facts about storms that have just occurred saying, yeah, this is what's going to happen. Winds will be about 75 miles an hour. 
which is minimal strength for a hurricane. Yes, these are the things that can happen. These are the action statements that we need to convey. These are the things the audience needs to do to protect themselves. But we'll all get through this. Because if you start screaming at the top of your lungs how this is a horrible storm and it's a category one, I mean, what do you have to do when it's a category five? It's to, it's to the point where you become numb to the uh, intensity of the storm. doesn't matter what it is. It's a storm. Be scared. Yeah. It reminds me of, you just reminded me of words um, that the words that come to mind is we're telling you how to feel, you know, and I, I don't like that at all. And of course the selling of fear, no stranger to, and I to, actually to witnessed it. that. I witnessed this in a newsroom in so? Albuquerque. I witnessed a producer who's now an executive producer in a large market typing a story out and saying it in a voice like this because he was the producer was just typing away trying to write the story with all of this emotion and and give it the uh, it, it was like he he's telling it and it's so important and and it it's a horrible fire and the flames were and just the, the the sound of his voice while he's writing it he's trying to convey his emotion into his writing instead of just just write the facts and let the anchor take it from there. You don't have to embellish. News is news. Why do you have to gin it up to be something it, it is not? And that's why people have lost so much faith in the industry today. Yeah. Um, the absence of adjectives can be a wonderful thing. When we quit telling people how to feel um, and just let those facts speak for themselves, they can be simply chilling. They can be memorable. They can be compelling. They can be inspiring, but showering text or script, a true crime book with adjectives. Um, it, to me, that all gets in the way of what's really underneath it, which is the, the heartbeat of the story or the situation that you're talking about. Yeah, this, uh, this is a really good uh, conversation, Larry, that brings up a lot of, a lot of themes. I, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, did you ever get feedback for not being like the guy or the gal, the woman on the other station where oh. you're going over the top, you know, in your estimation where you saw them doing it, but you held off and you didn't do it. Did you hear from viewers? Did you hear from colleagues and saying, glad you don't do that or glad you take the high road? I got, I got feedback from viewers, you know, thanks for being a calm voice, mm. you know, because the feeling that I got is if you see fear in my face and you see the intensity in my eyes going, this is is a storm you really need to take seriously this is going to be one heck of a storm and people could die and when you mm -hmm. convey that kind of information that's when you want to grab their attention you can't say that about every storm and then expect them to believe you we spoke earlier about the wonderful years you spent working at cairo television the cbs affiliate in seattle after that, as you mentioned in your career, you went to Albuquerque, New Mexico, and you went to KOB TV. And once again, a lot of really talented people, Tom Jules, Carla Aragon, Cindy Hernandez, John Mason, news director, Chris Berg, um, and followed by Brian Rackham. I don't know if you were still there when Brian came yes, on board. Yes, yeah, I was, I, I was there through, okay, through okay. many news directors. And then okay. and, and Brad Remington was the okay. news director who brought us to the top, and he was a calm voice among, he's one of the top five news directors that I've worked for in my career because he, he, there was no BS. In fact, there was a sign that he put up in the newsroom. First of all, he said to the newsroom, anybody in this newsroom who doesn't want to be number one can leave right now. And number two, he said, accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. It doesn't matter if we get it first, if we don't, get it right. And that's been completely lost today because you and I both see unconfirmed reports of da, 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 da. It's like, if it's unconfirmed, why are you reporting it? And how many sources do you need or should you need before you should go forward with that story? Right. It depends on the type of story, yeah. whether you need to have, if you're going to be accusing somebody of something, you better have two sources. Mm -hmm. As opposed to unconfirmed sources tell us charges have been filed. It's like, what? Mm -hmm. What I, I found since you and I both worked at KOB TV, you were there longer than me and you got there before me. 
but um, and I had worked at KRQE right across, across the street, the street. Um, for five years prior to the five years at KOB. And speaking for the market as a whole, once again, special. I thought for the market size, I think it was 48 in terms of market size, roughly. I found that the talent um, was beyond the market, you know, what you one might have in terms of perception of the market, because a lot of people wanted to make that home. They weren't trying to get to New York, New York City or Chicago or Detroit or Baltimore or Seattle, for that matter. They loved the land of enchantment. And I can see why, to me, looking back, that was a real magical time, um, both personally in terms of the travels, the people, the food, the culture, the, ge the geography, the weather, the storms, the spring winds. I'm just wondering how you look back at your time in New Mexico. Well, I treasure the time there. 13 years that I spent mm -hmm. there, had a, a son born there. Oh. Uh, my daughter uh, my daughter grew up there mm -hmm. and um, you know, we, um, we had two wonderful homes there, have great, wonderful friends. My wife is actually heading back to uh, a wedding uh, oh. for a friend of my daughter's. Um, she's getting married. And this was uh, the neighborhood that we lived in. This was a, she was four years old when we first met this girl and now all grown up and getting married. Um, a lot of great memories. Um, Balloon Fiesta, probably one of the best times mm -hmm. in New Mexico that uh, I can remember. And uh, my favorite place of all places to ski, and that is Taos. I, have, I, I skied exclusively at Taos the entire time I was there. I, mm -hmm. I never went to it. And I'm not saying that it's the best of all the places. It's just I fell in love with Taos and loved it. And that's where I would ski. I would drive the three hours there just to enjoy it. My kids learned to ski there. Had lots of, lots of great memories there. Fantastic. Uh it is truly a magical place. It gets in your blood, doesn't it? Especially uh, the green chili. Yes, absolutely. Or I say Christmas tree because I like the green and the red, so you get them both. Uh, um, stories that still give you goosebumps or resonate with you today that happened in New Mexico were very much in the news when you were there. I think I know one of them, but let's hear what comes to mind for you. Oh, it has to be the, uh, the uh, Los Alamos fire. That was it. That that that's the one because uh, I was on the air with Tom Jules for almost 15 and a half hours. And it was our job to convey information to help people who had been evacuated, where to go, how to find people who you can't get in touch with, uh, what resources are available. If you have lost your home, if you're worried about uh, your home or loved ones, uh, and of course, the the pictures that we had our helicopter up there for most of the time, uh, conveying the 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 horrible images of uh, if memory serves me right, Mark, you may know it was more than four hundred homes that were destroyed. And it was at least that, a couple hundred, but I don't remember the exact. I think number. it was. I think almost four hundred homes were destroyed as a result of what turned out to be a Bureau of Land Management controlled burn that got out of control. And the crazy thing is we saw the weather folks. We saw what was known as the Haynes index. I remember at a this. level five. I remember that a level five means you're starting a fire. Are you crazy? The conditions are conducive to horrible wildfires. And yet you're going to do a controlled burn. So let's talk that's about a government the, for you. So let's talk. Hey, let's talk about the dynamics here. So for the uh, for people who may not be aware of, of this fire, it was called the Cerro Grande fire. As Larry has mentioned, it started as a controlled burn. You know, there is this whole uh, and this was coming uh, upon recent seasons of fires in Ruidoso, Cloudcroft. And, you know, the popular opinion or belief was and, and perhaps still is, is that you need to thin these forests out. There's so much fuel packed in there. And so there was pressure and people believed wisdom in doing controlled burns. Um, of course, you want to have the ideal conditions. Now, here's what's really important to know. This is right up against the National Laboratory, Los Alamos National Laboratory. Um, birthplace of the atomic bomb. Birth, that's yeah, my next sentence, birthplace of the atomic bomb. And um, this is surrounded by forest, <laughs> rugged forest. Now, the gentleman who ultimately signed off on that and became a very controversial figure was one Roy Weaver. And I worked for months 
by this point, I had just come over from Channel 13, so I had a non-compete clause and I couldn't be on air. So I was working as an investigative uh, producer with you, uh, with the team you included at KOB, and finally secured an interview with Roy Weaver. And we had Tom Joles do the interview. He did a really good job. And we had that for a ratings book. And Roy, uh, I, I wrote, my heart went out to the guy. That guy, I'm not saying he's um, not without, you know, responsibility. Certainly there's responsibility. I know a lot of people would think not very well of him, but that sure landed heavily on his life and impacted his family profoundly. But it was Wednesday, May 10th, when I hit the road to go up to Los Alamos because there was a big fire that was getting out of control. And as you took that winding road, um, ultimately from Santa Fe to Española, and then you just short of Española and winding up to Los Alamos, just the plume and the clear blue sky that was growing, everything becoming orange. It was, you know, they've been talking about this big Oregon fire that's going on in Oregon right now that's creating its own weather. Well, I stood up, I stood up against the fire within inside the fire zone watching a fire, watching a, a storm, a firestorm do just that. The, the fire in the sky, the various fires within the plume, trees across the street from me exploding. So yeah, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much. But when you said Los Alamos, that's exactly where it is for me too. Many, yeah. memor many memorable stories, but that one was such, such an impactful story on, on humanity. It was, it was indeed. And so many lives were, were destroyed by what occurred there. Uh, but a lot of good news came out of that where the community came together yes. to help people. So you have to look at the good versus the, the, uh, the horrible things that happened as well and put, kind of put it all into perspective. A lot of what I see when it comes to overall, you know, these forest fires is that uh, we're not managing the land to begin with. You don't, first of all, lightning caused fires um, in many cases should be left to burn. This is how nature does its thing. This is how nature thins things out. And how many lightning caused fires are there in say New Mexico in a given year? I could, I, that, that fact is long gone from my brain, but, but it was uh, a you lot. Could say I remember it was a really hundreds, big number. Yeah. It was hundreds. hundreds or thousands. I was, I was blown away when I heard it. It was a and, big number and most how, of them burned themselves out. And I don't think many people understand that it's part of nature. Nature requires fire in order to continue, uh, uh, coniferous trees, pine cones do not open up without fire helping to open up the seed pods, those pine cones. And that's all part of the, the ash creates the, uh, the, the rich soil in which these trees can then continue to grow, but they need to be thinned out as well. And enter environmentalists, and I'm not putting a, a, a bad label on them. But if, if you say you can't cut down those trees because the, the, the spotted owl needs it or this or that, it's like, no, we have to balance things. Spotted owl can fly off and find some other home, but we have to make sure that the rest of this doesn't turn into a horrible mess. Well, this is a perfect segue. It's like a softball pitch here to talk about our current state of climate and wildfires. So I guess let's start with with the wildfires, uh, it, increasingly it seems we're seeing more of them, bigger ones, and we're you know it's as if smoke-filled skies are becoming a season. That there's no uh, unusual wonderment. Wow, look at the smoke! It's becoming seasonal. That in terms of the frequency, I don't think you would disagree with a trend in that in that aspect. But where you do. Uh, part ways with popular opinion, I would, I would venture to say, is on the notion of climate change. Could you speak to that, what's going on right now, and in, in your view of what's happening with um, the climate and why we're seeing so many fires? Well, we're probably seeing the same number of fires in, in an overall sense, but um, humans have encroached upon those wilderness areas that used to just burn and be way off in the distance. And now homes want to be built next to all these green belts and next to these forests because people like that, that ambiance and the aesthetics of living near uh, all of that greenery. And then when it goes up in flames, they're all like, oh my God, the, my, my house is in danger. And it's like, you well, know, you didn't re you didn't have a fire break. You didn't have all the proper things that you need to do to protect yourself. 
The other thing that that uh, frustrates me, uh, and not to to diverge from climate change, but utility companies for years, the lines would get knocked down and they keep putting them right back up on poles. It's like for crying out loud, bury those lines. Mm -hmm. It's a one-time expense and then the wind will never knock your power out again, will it? But society tends to always take the cheap route. For, uh, for several years when I was here in Seattle, uh, there was a horrible drought and they required, uh, they, they rely on two reservoirs, uh, Tolt Reservoir and Chester Morse Reservoir to supply the water to Seattle. And it's always about, it's a free source. It's the runoff from the mountains instead of, okay, we've got the technology now. You live right next to this body of water, Puget Sound. Why aren't you installing desalinization plants? And then you can pipe that water inland to wherever you need it to go. We spend all the money piping gasoline and piping crude oil and natural gas, but nobody wants to pipe fresh water. There's, there's value in that. It's interesting you bring that up because years ago, I telephoned and was able to speak to Tom Snyder. <laughs> and at that time, there was talk of desalinization plants in the Middle East. And I was like, why aren't we doing that here? <laughs> why, why can't we be doing that here? Especially, you know, having worked in the Southwest and we talk about, you know, the flow of the Colorado River and water rights from the Colorado and, you know, where those lines are and the, the scarcity of that resource and um, the outlook in the future of just how valuable um, water will continue to be. And it's, you know, it's only becoming more valuable. It, it, it harkens me back to my first news director in 1978. Mm -hmm. um, he's now retired, enjoying a great life uh, back in, in Indiana, but it was in Bakersfield, California, uh, where he said, uh, the one big story in this state, if there's no other story, it'll be water rights, water rights in California. And, you know, blood will be spilled, politics will be heated. It's all about water rights and who gets to have it and who doesn't. And it's a battle between farming and urban life. And Los Angeles is like this one big vacuum that just is sucking up so much of the water supply that um, the Colorado River used to flow into uh, the Bay of California, I believe, between Baja and uh, Mexico. And it's now um, just mudflats. There's not much water left that actually makes it into back to the ocean from the Colorado River Basin. You studied weather prior to beginning your broadcast career, I believe, at two universities. I think that you did study at Mississippi State University that was related and, to weather. Yeah, and, and University, University of Washington. Washington, yes. And you, um, you became a meteorologist. You did weather at least five nights a week, days and or nights, for umpteen, more than umpteen years. And yet, people may be surprised to learn that you don't really buy the, the climate change argument. Um, what is your big picture view of what's happening in terms of climate? It's this religious dependence upon the computer models say in the next 20 years, this will happen. Well, you and I have been around long enough to have seen those dire predictions come and go. They haven't happened. And it's like, oh, okay, but they will. Oh, okay, but they will. You know, it's like, I, I just don't have a lot of faith in computer models telling us about something 50 years from now, when today we have a problem with computer models predicting weather accurately 10 to 15 days out. I know predicting weather and predicting climate, two different things, and I might be getting way above uh, my pay grade, so to speak, in knowledge of it, but I've seen enough information and read enough books to see that this cycle occurs every 1500 years or so. Temperature goes up, temperature goes down. Glaciers retreating in Greenland. Oh my, we're losing the glaciers in Greenland. What's happening to this world? Well, as the glaciers retreat, civilization is uncovered that used to live there when it was Greenland. And then the ice age occurred and then the ice comes and goes. It's just part of nature. And we're one little small speck on this big giant uh, rock that's been existing for what, 4 billion years or so. And we'll come and go just like other species. But to think that we can actually control the weather, I mean, I just don't buy it. 
the carbon dioxide is this villainous gas, yet it comprises about one tenth to one hundredth of a percent of the atmosphere. That's the percentage of the atmosphere that is CO2. Yet we have plants that all depend on that. The one, one greenhouse gas that people don't even understand is the most prolific greenhouse gas, and that is water vapor. That's 4% of the atmosphere. And water vapor, when you have the clouds, that is enough of a greenhouse in itself to hold in the heat. You know what it's like when it's cloudy overnight, the temperatures don't drop. When the skies are clear, the mm -hmm. temperature plummets <laughs> as the heat radiates away. You know, so it's Larry, just a, it, that's one of two things I learned filling in to do weather at a little known station that once existed called KCWT in Wenatchee, Washington, the early Fox affiliate back in the mid 80s, is that the cloud phenomena, you know, the effect of the clouds overhead holding, you know, when they're there, they help keep the temperature it contained. And when they're gone, the heat rises and escapes and things get colder. The other one was ripping wire back in the day and reading the weather copy was that high pressure ridge. And the high pressure ridge was that wall of pressure just off the coast, north, south, generally, that deflected any spinning uh, storms coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. <laughs> they would meet that ridge and therefore wouldn't come inland. We would have sunny skies. So I became a, as a young man, a big fan of the high pressure ridge because it meant the weather was going to be good. <laughs> it also, it, you know, it's, it's just simple physics and yeah. you don't have to get into the math to understand it yeah. is the atmosphere is always looking for equilibrium. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure. And depending on how steep the gradient is between that high and the low, that's where you get strong winds and strong effects in the atmosphere. It's you not were linear. You were mentioning um, the big picture and we're just in the speck of time. You mentioned glaciers, you know, coming and going. And there was a story I, I saw it in the news just yesterday. I think it was in in Russia where um, the frost is 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 melting away and they're finding the the uh, the remains of very old creatures to include. I think it said woolly mammoths. I think so, you're referring to permafrost. The permafrost. Yes. Yes where the ground is in a state yeah. of constant freeze. And yeah. now that it's melting, they're finding the uh, remains of uh, ancient creatures. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, now I'd like to bring it back. Uh, you've been very generous with your time. We've been going live for, it looks like 42 minutes. Do you have a bit more time? I do. Thank you. The, um, well, we'll bring it back to journalism. What didn't exist in 2000, 2005, when I was at KOB working with you, with social media. I think MySpace came right around 2005 or just afterwards. And there's no, there's no doubt that it's had a profound impact on, on all of us in many ways. One of the things that I've kind of felt was odd, and I feel alone in this oftentimes, is watching journalists um, reading and listening to them share their opinions very out, in a very outspoken way on social media. And it gets back to that, I guess, I guess the way I learned it, journalism, that I felt I was there to be a window and not to be the story and that my views should be self-contained and you should not know my views. Um, and I should be aiming for uh, to be as fair as possible because we can't be completely objective, but we should strive to be as fair as possible. What is your take on, and I mean, I'm, it's not just young journalists. I've watched a lot of older journalists you know, with very direct sentences proclaim where they stood on issues. How do you feel about that? I mean, shouldn't they be able to have some form of self-expression away from work, especially? And, but there just seems to be a balancing act at the very least, and maybe a, a serious concern in what ultimately becomes what we consume as media. Well, we had those we had those places to share opinions, and that was after work we'd go to the local pub and we'd all have a beer and mm -hmm. share opinions about things. But we shared it among our group. It was always the, you know, sort of that close knit group of. Uh, I, I can speak, in, for example, in Fresno, we were all competitors until eleven thirty. And then we all went over to the silver dollar, it's channel 30, channel 47, channel 24, all the anchors and weather folks and reporters, we'd all gather around. We just have a great time talking about things because we're competitors on the air, but we were friends off the air. And I think a lot of that uh, gets lost today because of the cutthroat competition. 
And when it comes to expressing yourself on social media as a journalist, when it, at least for television journalists, you're pressured by your management to get followers and your popularity is judged by the number of people following you on social media. You know, if you don't have 5,000 people following you on Twitter, or if you don't have a Facebook account that now has a special page because you can only have 5,000 friends or whatever, then there's something wrong. You're not doing something. You're not making a big enough impact out there. But as we talked about, the audience is so fragmented that you know, even when you're tweeting or sending out Facebook messages, you're not reaching the same kind of audience we did back in the day when it was what I believe was a, a better quality of journalism. When you work for a television station, they oftentimes give you a jacket. At King 5 in Seattle, they're perhaps known as the yellow jackets. Certainly in Albuquerque, we had our blue jackets with the four on them and the red patch. Um, but is now nowadays, is the journalist, him or herself, a brand? It is. It really is. It, and it, again, it's, it, it's about just doing what you're told as opposed to go out and get the story. The producers have already, and, and you've probably seen it in your career, where the producer goes, I need this soundbite. And it's like, uh, uh, you need what? You need me to go out and get somebody to say this for your story, for your newscast. And it's like, are you kidding me? You go out and get the sound and then write the story around it. Don't uh, producers in many cases these days have the story written in their head and the theme for the newscast for the five o'clock news before 11 o'clock in the morning. They've got it all blocked out. And this is the hole they're filling and be damned if anything else happens. We have a comment in the chat. I'll read it aloud. Uh, it's not a question. We have a comment. Part of this may be the general idea that people who choose to be in the public eye in some way are more in the public eye and expected to match a degree of the expected decorum of the position you hold or the company you may be a public face of in some way. So you're basically, you have to get on board with that company's culture or... You drink the Kool-Aid or you <laughs> hit the road. And that's where I feel, and, and I, I, I know at least a handful of journalists in this area, in Western Washington, who literally just go out and they do their job as best they can, but they bite their tongue because they do have things I bet they'd want to say, but they would be belittled in their own newsroom for having the views that they have. And there's no diversity of views in a newsroom. You either are following what, for lack of a better word, is a very liberal view, or you shut your mouth because it's, uh, I need this paycheck. It's, let's face it, you and I both know it was rewarding work. It was fun work. But let's be honest, this was not hard work at all. This was not hard work. And the reason why is because we love to do it. And when you do something you love, it's not difficult. Very addictive, very adrenaline oriented. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are a lot of things that made it appealing. I think in some ways it takes its toll when um, when you have to go. There were times I was sent out of town, I, you know, on rare occasions where it really wasn't the best timing in my personal life. Um, and I had no... I had no ability to say no, I had to go. Um, or I was gonna be basically belittled. Um, and, I, and, I, and I lived that and then that's always, uh, that was always a profound moment given what was going on in my personal life at the time. Um, but there is no doubt, I mean, I would tell police uh, sources, you can call me 24 seven. So that when the runaway bride showed up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, mm -hmm. in a phone booth on Central Avenue, all Route 66. Um, I, I got the phone call from the producer at the assignment's desk at three o'clock in the morning. And I was a single dad at that point and dragged my son, my young son into the newsroom, put him in an office to watch a TV and went off and covered that story. Um, but, you know, I chose that. And um, there, there was, there were, there, you know what, in no two days were like, you know, all the wonderful things we would say about what, how we, I would tell people, perhaps a cliche. I don't know a lot about any one thing, but I know a lot about a little about a lot of things, right? We'd be good right? Jeopardy contestants. Yeah, very good. And always we would remember to ask it in the form of a question. <laughs> uh, 
Um, good to see uh, that Adam uh, is watching. Uh, Paige, my wife, is watching and is an attendee. And Tony Mobley, I think Tony, I know he's back east. And I'm trying to remember whether Tony's in Washington, D.C. or uh, further south in the southeast. But Tony, great to have you along. Thank you for checking it out. Tony's with office hours and has a really neat, he's doing what I'm doing. Uh, he um, He's also doing something like this, calling um, it's Tech Talk, uh, Conversations with Tony Mobley, and it's Tech Talk for all generations, making things understandable, being there as a resource to help people when it comes to tech. And especially for you know a lot of boomers, not that it's exclusive, but this stuff can be kind of overwhelming. You know, I've there's an older person in my, um, in my not my immediate, but in my family who, a couple of them who really struggle with a phone and then understandably so, because again, they're really computers, right? They are. Yeah. But do you find it interesting how the media, the industry that we used to work in has gone through this amazing bell curve? Uh, back when I started in 1978, I was actually in radio first and, and really didn't have a desire to be in television. I was sort of dragged into it uh, willingly. Uh, but it was film going to three quarter inch videotape. You know, mm. it was the Umatic was the wave of the future and these giant backpacks that you had to carry with batteries and stuff. Yeah, we've all done that before. Uh, and and then it became, you know, you needed the high quality beta cameras with $60,000 lenses on the camera. The CCD so the, chip. Yes. And, <laughs> and what are we, we've gone now completely to the point where, we'll just go out with an iPhone because the quality of the iPhone and a little tiny uh, stick, and you can, you can go and do what you're doing. You can do what it took three people at a large station in Los Angeles, like KABC to do. You'd have a producer, you'd have a grip, you have an audio person, camera person, I, and the reporter all going out. And now you can, you're all self-contained. You can even have your own news helicopter because I bet when you go out, you have a drone. <laughs> now, I don't have a drone. It's been on my list for about 15 years. But, you know, the last two of the last three nights I've gone out with an iPhone. I didn't even use sticks because the stabilization is so awesome on my iPhone 12 Pro Max. And I shot two fires for a little bit of video that were just in our immediate area. And it's it's just laughable, even the low light quality where it's not a, a well-lit street. It's just amazing how well these things do. So I used to shoot both sports and news when I got into the business and I shot on those big Sony Ikigami or those actually those Ikigami cameras, big tube cameras with the big brick batteries, the TK47 RCA and then the big you had blue the pneumatic decks with the three quarter inch mm -hmm. tape. And I used to do a lot of not only sports up and down the sidelines with that stuff. I used to go up into the cascades and do stories on Peregrine Falcon reintroduction, bighorn sheep inoculations, um, bull trout or Dolly Varden fish shocking surveys. And I would carry the tripod. I'd wear the heavy light belt. Remember the light belts? Mm -hmm. And then that three quarter inch deck, you had to have batteries and you go for it through at least two of them. And those were called PB nineties. And they were about that big with a little, you know, belly, a little cord, you know, the plug in. And it was a lot of weight. It kept you in, in Eastern Washington and, and the Eastern slopes of the Cascade in the summertime. That would keep you in shape going up those deep grades. I'm telling you. But I, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, and, we, had, we had plenty of good gear back in the day to cover yeah. the stories, and, but we got to cover some quality stories. Yeah. The one that comes to mind, you mentioned uh, Peregrine Falcon. Uh, we were sent, uh, we actually flew in Chopper 7 up near concrete. And there was oh. this uh, reservoir that um, Puget Sound Energy needed to fill with more water, but there were some osprey, Seahawks, some osprey. Yeah. There was a nest that would be in danger and they literally had to go move the nest. And our story was to show the, how they were going to move the nest and then put this on a giant pole uh, that they had constructed and moved this nest. And the problem with the nest is, you know, Seahawks are messy eaters and they leave a lot of fish guts and that in the nest. And lo and behold, we're trying to move the nest. Uh, you know, not we, but the, the, the folks with the Puget Sound Energy and the Forest Service. And they're just loaded with yellow jackets because they're going after all of that meat that's in there. So some of the funny things that happen on stories that really don't make it into the actual story itself, just stick with me. It's funny how times change. And this may be um, just different in different countries, but just to the north of us in British Columbia, 
east of Vancouver, British Columbia. There's a story. Um, I don't even know if it's made its way to the mainstream media. I have a friend who's been covering it and he's been live streaming and he's got an 800 millimeter lens, Nikon lens, and he's using it to live stream to show an osprey nest right on the edge of this area where they blast rock granite for whatever they use it for. <laughs> you should be more, better informed on that. But it's shocking that this is happening with this osprey nest that had eggs in it. And there were even questions, would the, would the eggs hatch because of the impact of the blast? You'd literally watch the blasting and you'd see the nest on the 800 millimeter lens and all this dust rises and clouds the view. You can't even see the nest. And I contrast that to what you described, the story that you covered up by concrete. Um, different, different sensitivity, it seems. But we still had to turn it around for the five o'clock news. Oh, the, the, that's the one thing that you did not have the luxury of in those days is they had a great diversity of stories in the newscast. It wasn't all just one big theme. You had like 10 or 12 really good stories in the newscast that were produced with uh, you know, a photographer, reporter out in the field. And then the rest of it was all the little VOs and sound bites and, and, yeah. you know, and wire stories that would fill it all out. The best segue in television news to be was in other news, it didn't have to flow. You could go from, yeah. from Vietnam. I'm thinking back in the Walter Cronkite days. Mm -hmm. You go from a story on Vietnam to a story on Capitol Hill. You know, in other news on Capitol Hill today, boom, and just completely shift gears. And it was all quality information. It was stuff that was important. This was like, you need to know all of these things. And that kind of news thinking has gone by the wayside. Even... Do Even in the newspapers, they've done the same thing. On the front page of a newspaper, there used to be all these different stories. And now it's like big headline, a lot of big pictures, and, and not a lot of really good quality information in many cases. Do you, do you find the news ever to come across as condescending? I'll be perfectly honest with you. I have stopped watching television news. I can just pick up this guy right here and I get everything that I need. And it's not, uh, it's not from one particular source. I, I have all kinds of different sources. And in many cases, it's Twitter, because AP will put something out or, or another news organization will put it out on Twitter. And it's, it's how I think the industry is destroying itself. Remember how you used to have appointment television, you would have to tune in at five o'clock to get the news of the day. Well, you know, my wife's a big fan of World News Tonight, and World News Tonight has this uh, very formulaic way of doing things. For the first two minutes, David Muir tells you what's going to be coming up in the newscast. And then by the time you get to the point where he's telling you what he told you in the first two minutes, they've only given you a 10 second snippet. And sometimes they've teased it for 30 seconds. And when you finally get to the story, it's only 10 seconds. And then they end the newscast with usually some video from the internet that most people have already seen, but the producer of the newscast can't resist because I've got to have that in my newscast. You know, that kind of thinking. I got to have that video because it's so cute or so <laughs> wonderful. It doesn't matter that it's old news. What's interesting to me, Larry, is, and I observed this when I was a kid, where we had four, five, and seven. Those are the three primary stations, Channel 9, Channel 11, Channel 12, and Channel 8 out of British Columbia. That was it. I noticed back then on that Channel 8 out of British Columbia, the news was delivered differently. It was a more even level tone. And to this day, I feel like the Canadians, in my view, get it right where there's more of a dignity, I guess, uh, attached to the delivery, just more of an even keel. It's changed though. But in Canada, they have a little different pressure. You know, they, you know the First Amendment here is uh, a little bit stronger, although it's under attack. It has a bit, a bit, more, a bit more punch in this country uh, as opposed to the freedom of speech in Canada. I mean, even the forecasters up there must use the Environment Canada forecast. You can't deviate. Oh, you can explain right? weather in your own words, but when it comes to the actual temperatures, everybody's on the same page. Environment Canada. Oh, I had no idea. I, 
That's yeah. So you can't have your own forecast. So when you are looking to who does the best weather, it's all about personality, not about accuracy. Wow. Well, I tell you what, we're getting some good, um, some good comments in the chat. And if I do see at least one question mark, if you have a specific question, if you want to boil that down for the q and I'd be happy to ask Larry. Um, in fact, I think Larry could see things as well. But um, I, I don't I know. I see one I can... here. I see. So maybe as predicted shows like The Daily Show may really have become the most reliable source of daily news with a bit more background to the story. I would tend to agree. I miss John Stewart. He did news. If you're going to comment on the news, let's comment on the news then. If you're going to be opinionated, don't disguise it as objective journalism. Just go on the air and give me your opinion. Then I can decide which one I want to watch, who has the opinion I like. I enjoyed Jon Stewart because when it came to his opinion, he was he he was apolitical he'd go after everybody it's kind of uh, it was it was a harder approach than the johnny carson way of making fun of politics didn't matter who was in office they'd always make fun of the president whether it was carter reagan clinton bush no matter who there would always be late night jokes and that came to an end in 2009 there were no more real late night jokes, except maybe on the tonight show with Jay Leno. And then the pressure seemed to be, don't be doing jokes about the president. Hmm. Earlier near the beginning of this conversation, you talked about the pressures that you, people such as yourself in the business could feel where you're being told to do something that you didn't feel like was right to talk about, go on, do a cut in, break into regular programming and talk about a storm that, um, you may feel is not a big deal or a true threat, but talk about not only talk about it, but convey the energy and what have you and sell it. So people tune in at 11 or exaggerate 10. it. Yeah. Exaggerate it. I've got to believe in fairness though, Larry, that people in journalism today are fighting those forces. If they want to be in the business as much, if not even more so today. And it's one reason why I don't think I could be in the business today. Cause I just don't think I could throw a smile on my happy smile on my face on in some cases where they want a happy smile. And I, you know, I, I'm more about, I'm more about being neutral and fair. Rather I made than, the conscious decision a long, a long time ago. When I say a long time ago, um, July, 2017, when I did my last weather cast in Montana and uh, I just, I, I thought that it would be an emotional time knowing that this is the last time I'm ever going to do this. And it was cathartic. It was like, ah, and I smiled. The other people get into tears and, you know, it's like, oh my God. And then it was, it, it, no, not for me. It was like, it was in the rear view mirror and by Felicia, all I'm done with it. Wow. That's it. It's interesting because not be, just a few years before you went to Montana, you were at Como Radio, the ABC affiliate in Seattle, KOMO. Yes. And I came down to the station. You were very gracious. You allowed me to come down and visit you and meet some of your colleagues and see where you worked. And I remember instead of seeing the AP or UPI wire there, you were on Twitter. And you mentioned that earlier. And so even I would say that. So obviously that was prior to 2017. I'm going to guess that was around 2010. Yeah, I, I was at uh, Como from 2011 to 2014. Okay, so it was in the, it was probably 2011 because mm -hmm. I remember I had done a story that caught your eye. It was about a young lady named Heather Lurch that was killed texting and driving. So it was it was during that time. Okay, very good. Um, you mentioned that you don't watch the news today, and I'm, I'm about to finish up. Truth be told, I don't watch much news at all myself. I get it. I consume it in other ways, including Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Um, and it's, I was thinking about this earlier today because, gosh, when I was an up and coming reporter, when I was working in Yakima, Washington, everybody was about recording the competition. So we take those umatic three quarter inch tapes and make sure we had air checks rolling on all the other stations. And there would be somebody writing down what the competition had through their rundown and what they have. Why didn't we have it or what they didn't get this. And then after the show, we'd all come together. What did this station have? What did those guys have? I mean, we were just consuming 
news, 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 news. And now, you know, if I do turn it on, I'm probably going to watch, I have it's my DVR, or my YouTube TV, more accurately recording Como News at 11. But you had um, to be competitive. That's why you did that yeah. in a day when being competitive meant advertising revenue. Because again, television lives and dies by it. But the mm -hmm. sad part about uh, the traditional media today is that um, Facebook and Google suck up more advertising dollars than all the broadcast networks combined. I mean, they're just, there's such a small little sliver out there. And that's why, again, you're seeing a lot of very young, fresh faces. And it's not, I don't think it's, it's because uh, they want all these hotties on the air. I think it's because you can get them on the cheap. Because let's face it, to get somebody like Aaron Brown to go from this market to the network, they had to pay some really big bucks. Those mm -hmm. days are over. There's actually, a, it was an agent of mine who told me, and I'm not going to name the name of the company. It's a national company that uh, owns a large group of television stations, and they do own one of the big stations in Seattle. And somehow a memo leaked from management to where it, the, the rule that they wanted to institute in a newsroom was under 70, under 40. Mm. That means that anybody on the air had to be under 40. Wow. And their salary had to be under 70 K wow. that was, that was their goal. Yeah. And it might've taken them years, but that is the end goal because they have stockholders to answer to. They do not have the same revenue they used to have. So they have to start cutting corners Yeah, and cutting corners means, you know, unconfirmed sources and filling well, news with weather that is, is literally boring at many, in many cases. To, to be fair, I, and what you're saying, I believe to be true, but there's a, there's also a side of it where we didn't make good money. So some of us, when we first got into the business, I remember starting in Wenatchee, as I mentioned earlier, and I had groaned about something to the station manager. And he said, he turned in his chair in his office and he said, you see that stack of tapes? There's like all these three quarter inch tapes that have been mailed. You know how it was. People mailed their tapes off. It was nearly to the ceiling. He goes, if you don't like it here, somebody else will. You guys come a dime a dozen. <laughs> I've and always, yeah, I've always remembered that. I think I was pulling in about 16 grand a year. And, and today in, in Montana, I mean, I was paid a really good salary to go to Montana to help this company start up um, a statewide morning show on the seven stations that they own there. And they knew they had to make an investment in the anchor that they hired and in me to get it off the ground, knowing full well that by the time three years was up, they would be bringing in what you would normally see in a market like Montana. And that would be kids, for lack of a better word, getting out of college who will work for $25,000 a year. Well, break that down, you know, 52 weeks times 40 hours a week. And, you know, you can really make about the same work in a a supermarket or working at a fast food restaurant and sometimes make a little bit more working at a restaurant waiting tables because the tips are bigger. You don't get tips in the news industry. And it's also a place where, you know, Montana was interesting to find that some of the people that I watched at the network level or in a market like Los Angeles, they were actually had retired to Montana to work at these small stations at the one I worked at. Uh, there was a, uh, the main anchor on the station. I believe he's still there. Greg Lamott, a very well-known reporter from CNN. I remember uh, the name. Yeah. Cairo, uh, based in Cairo, Egypt, uh, it traveled all over the world. Um, Donna Kelly. Oh, sure. One of the anchors. She's an anchor in Bozeman, Montana. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to be watching contact the other night and realized yeah. oh, there, there's not only Conroy Chino yeah. <laughs> with our KOB truck in the background, yeah. but there's Donna Kelly uh, in that as well. So looking back it, you know, those were the, those were the big days and those were the fun days. Yeah. When you went to Montana, then you and a colleague, you guys came in, you were paid and you were literally like the, I don't know what the term is, rocket boosters, but you were there for that initial liftoff and then you would be released from the craft to spiral back to earth. They had to hire top, uh, top level talent to get eyeballs to watch. It wasn't just another young face sort of stumbling along. Yeah. And we helped to mentor 
the people who took our place. And uh, granted, they've done a fine job with the, the talent that they have, but they're paying an awful lot less. To, to your point about YouTube and, and uh, Facebook, where the money really, the, where the advertising spends are really taking place, I didn't read the story. I saw a headline and a pretty young lady's picture. New York Times Today, I believe. I saw it online. She's a social influencer and she's being paid, I think it was in the neighborhood of $30 million to be part of um, some production that may be talk related. I think she does some kind of edgy talk uh, in social in a social space. So that's, you know, more of what we're seeing. And it's a whole nother show, I think, um, to talk about, you know, what is to become of this era that we're currently in where we're, where there's this peeling off, it feels, of the what, what was 20th century way of going about doing news, late 20th century, and what we're becoming and what is becoming. And, and these, these big corporations global, you know, with global audiences um, really taking over. And I don't know if I would say hijacking, but that's where people are going. And there's a lot more that goes from us than just our eyeballs. There's a lot that they're consuming off of us. And that could be a whole nother show. But it, yeah, it, 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 it's gone off on a crazy tangent, uh, you know, with radio stations that are putting their content onto smart speakers. And then, okay, you're now on a smart speaker, which means that people aren't listening to you on the radio and how do you measure that kind of an audience? Um, but Larry, this is not all of it's new. I'm so reminded of consultants having oh. to be, have, have one-on-one -on -one with, for example, um, consultants from Frank Maggot and associates. And if you've ever driven across country, cross country, and I, I remember 20 odd years ago, driving across country, and I would hear the same catchphrases, the same slogans, the same music for branding the, a particular station, you know, between Albuquerque and um, Dayton, Ohio, on my road trip. And it's the same mantras of we win weather. And so there was just the recognizable voices literally doing the promos, the same jargon, the same slogans, right? Um, this is seemed to be Heavily favoring the, the, the channel sevens, <laughs> but it was, you know, and the graphics uh, too. I mean, the graphics yeah, are yeah, very similar graphics, because was you... very, everything was becoming homogenous. And I think that there's, there's been a lot of salt of the earth type investigative and digging type journalism. And it doesn't even have to reach that type of depth in the, what could be a fertile landscape or fertile soil to do really meaningful and interesting, truly news stories of value because everything's become so homogenized something's been lost along the way and it was something that made it made things really special part of the charm and maybe i'm romanticizing looking back but i really do believe that if you look back uh you know the the one of the touchstone events in my life just prior to me getting in in 1978 of course watergate mm. and Woodward and Bernstein, you know, all the president's men to go, Woodstein, Woodstein, <laughs> and what they did and watching. And, and, you know, obviously that was embellished for the sake of a movie, but at least you saw Ben Bradley going, you know, when am I going to get confirmation? Where are the sources? Where are the sources today? Yeah. They would have gone on with some of the unconfirmed stuff just for the sake of, of having it first. And we've lost that that edge. And I think that, uh, you know, there are people who got into the business wanting to be the next Bob Woodward or Carl Bernstein, but they've lost the, the kind of moral compass that mm -hmm. they had at the time about making sure they get it right. Yeah. And, and again, it wasn't perfect back in the day. Cause I remember very much, um, you know, around 2000, just the whole and late nineties. And you saw it earlier, I'm sure the whole mantra about, going live. We have to have a live shot. This one in the rundown has to be a live shot. And we went live for the sake of going live because it made the newscast uh, look different than if you were just doing a straight taped story or st sitting in the newsroom. Um, it became part of, you know, it was, not, it was the expect it was the expectation. And it was demanded that you be live, whether it was something that was breaking or not and breaking what was became what was breaking news? The evolution of breaking news wasn't something that happened five minutes ago. It could have been ha something that happened five hours ago, ten hours ago, and if we couldn't feel at peace with ourselves after twelve hours, 
we, we sure clung to developing story. We tried to make like, we're still trying to figure out the mystery. You know what I mean? Because we know people want to find out what the ending is going to be like. They, you know, people do not consume news the way consultants consume news. They're mm-hmm. hired to go in and, you know, you, you, you wonder at times, has a consultant ever gone into a television station and go, you know, I've been paying attention and taking notes and watching. You guys really don't change a thing. You're doing it right. They'll always find something wrong because they have to justify their existence. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. Consultants have interesting things to say that you might not expect. A lot of what we're talking about is familiar and, and preached across the country from consultants. But when I was in the late 90s in Albuquerque, um, I had a consultant say to me, you were sitting in the edit bay looking at my tape. He pauses it and he says, you're the way you speak. You have a, um, what kind of an accent is it? It's a, is it a Mormon accent? <laughs> I said, Mormons have accents? Where did you grow up? He asked. Well, I, I, I grew up in the Seattle area. Oh, that's it. You were near the border with Canada. I just thought that was really strange. <laughs> so I don't notice any I don't notice any accent on you at all there, my friend. Eh? It's just <laughs> like I, I have Canadians in my family, so I know what an accent is. <laughs> and it's not you... something that I talk about much. So so <laughs> a boat. Do a you boat. Have a... Have you been known to have a jug? <laughs> <laughs> no, every once in a while at the weekend barbecue, we'll have a two for, you know? Yeah, there you go. When I, when I was in Green Bay, uh, when I was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, gosh, what was that type of talk referred to as? Oh, Upers for the Upper Peninsula, uh, the UP of Michigan, right? Mm-hmm. Upers. The Upers and... Uh, so you go, hey, someone might ask directions and you say, well, you go down to the third stop and go there and you go into that bar on the left there and you go to the bubbler and you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but the dare is not Canadian. That's Scandinavian. There's a lot of Scandinavian is influence that, that in that area. To, oh, yes. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. oh okay, Oli, it's time to go there. <laughs> and for, for the record, I got to say, Green Bay was a fantastic community. You, If you said hello back to the old lady coming out of the supermarket in the parking lot, you were going to be in a 10-minute conversation. That's At least the one, I would be. That's the one thing about those uh, smaller towns. They do have personality. Yeah, they have personality. Wonderful people. I really enjoyed working there. Wonderful community. Well, Larry, um, before we say goodbye, what brings you joy today? Is there something that brings you that rush or adrenaline? I think you're at peace with not being in news. Um, how do you enjoy your life today? Got a, a granddaughter who's going to turn four in September, and she is just just like uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It's like watching my daughter grow up all over again, and how my cool daughter has turned into such a great mom. And uh, it's just it's just so much joy and and fun watching her. I mean, I, I kid around and I say she's my second Emmy. The first Emmy I had was a crappy little gold statue I got for doing weather. That's and, awesome. But you she has to... to remind me now, uh, now that she's older and talking, she goes, it's Emily, Papa. It's Emily. Because <laughs> every once in a while I'll slip and I'll say, hi, Emmy. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I, um, I, I want you to know that I, I truly value our friendship. I know we don't talk regularly, but I found comfort and um, uh, stimulating conversation. Those moments that we had a break in the weather office in the evening, perhaps the early evening, and I think you put on some coffee and we had nice conversations. And, and you know and what? We could, be, we could be completely polar opposites politically. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah. It, I kind of like think... And I don't know what your politics are. And I don't know if you know what mine are, but I don't care. It, yeah. I don't need to know that. That's not part of, not part of the dynamic that, uh, that brings us together as friends. Right. And we need more of this, in my opinion. And we spoke about this pre-show. You were talking about it. And I had said it a different way last week. And I'll say it again. We live at a time when so many people seem poised to have these um, imaginary guns that are loaded in their holsters and they're twitching and excited for the opportunity to pull and blast somebody in effect, diminishing for them, them for what they had written in a tweet or on Facebook or what have you on something on Instagram, just basically seemingly um, not to have, maybe it's not even appropriate to respond um, 
but very just the, looks, people seem like they look for that opportunity to, to try and silence and dare I say, cancel people, diminish people. There's a lot of hostility out there. And one of the cool things in those post work meetings with others in our industry that we worked in at the Time News, where people came to together, say, at the local watering hole or where have you, is that, yeah, we were competitors. We could have those different points of view again, and we could have discourse. We could talk. We could share. The main thing that remained was respect. And we, quite frankly, loved the challenging thoughts that others presented to us, different points of view. It's part of being human. It's part of personal growth. It's part of introspection. But those things, it's harder to do with that, it seems, with a larger community these days. But that's, by golly, one of the things I'm aiming to do here is to try and grow a community. At least I'm going to take a swing at it here in Horner's Corner and having your voice here tonight. Well, uh, I appreciate that. And leaving you with this thought, if we would stop going through the world with this thought in our mind, and I'm not labeling everybody or painting the broad brush, but so many people go through the world today with this attitude. How can you be so stupid as to not see things my way, mm -hmm. as opposed to respecting the other person might have a different opinion and let them have their opinion. Don't worry about controlling the rest of the world. Think about how much more at peace you would be if you would just ignore that tweet that sets you off because mm -hmm. all you're doing is giving the person who gave that offensive tweet more attention, which is really mm -hmm. what some people are striving to get. That's they right. just, you know, if they, it, it, what is it with a child? It doesn't matter if they get negative attention as long as they're getting attention. Yeah. Yeah. So let's be more positive in the world. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking, um, let's be more positive. And I feel, you know, in a way, my, I feel empathy for people who invest so much energy into what can oftentimes seem like hate. Uh, there is a question, and Adam asked it. Let me throw this at you, Larry, because um, it's in the actual Q&A area, and I just don't want to exclude him. I want to include him. He says, while there were many people delivering editorial content over the years in news media, what do you feel was the first real instance of the current generation of news commentary versus newscasting journalism. Who really pushed it from a sideline of a newscast to being the primary news broadcast itself? Thanks. Thank you for the question, Adam. I, I don't know when it actually happened. It was kind of like a slippery slope that began a long time ago. And I say a long time ago in my early part of my career. I'm one of the I didn't call it a blessed as to be a journalist back in Bakersfield, which is where I basically made my bones as a, as a journalist, we were treated like the reporters that you saw in television shows in the fifties and the sixties, you got to be behind the police tape. You were in the fire line. I was at the plane crash right at the scene. Um, right. At, you know, the, the detective is saying, don't knock over my evidence marker. Be careful. Don't shoot any pictures of that. You can shoot this and this, but don't shoot that because we had trust with those organizations. But somebody along the way decided to, oh, he's not looking. Let me roll and I'll get something exclusive that nobody else has. So somebody broke the rule and that's like, okay, the news media acting like children. Okay, now all you children go to your room. So that's why we're now treated, the media is treated as the public can be right up against the yellow line, but the media has to be even, even farther back. They're just, they're not given that treatment of, yeah, oh. it's the news media. Your press pass is a, just a, basically a useless card. It does not get you yeah. any, uh, any extra privileges when it comes to a crime scene or anything these days? Oh, yeah, we used to, it's you know, gone. We used to get frustrated 20 years ago in Albuquerque when um, I'd show up at a scene, for example, let's say it was a fire and the public was right up there against you know the scene. But as soon as you as a reporter or you, with your photographer with that big camera showed up, whoa, 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 whoa. Now, you know, everybody back, everybody back, you know, so we got mm -hmm. pushed away. So that was that was going on at least 20 years ago. So it was the respect yeah. that we had for law enforcement, for the fire department, for the mm -hmm. medical professionals doing their job. And we knew what was in good taste. 
taste. Mm -hmm. It can still be news and still be in good taste, but we crossed the line when, you know, news had to be shocking, Yeah, you know, and, and shocking meant taking pictures. Of, we have these exclusive pictures from the murder scene. No Hilarious. one else has this. It's just, you're, you're, you're so baiting me and you don't even know it, but I used years ago, used to joke and people who I worked with have heard this from me to the point where they can recite it to this day, BTS and D brutal, tragic, shocking, and deadly. So you have a cold open, the brutal murder and what murder isn't brutal. And then you have that little sound bite pop. And then they come out to a two shot on the anchors, the tragic story. And then you toss it to the reporter who says the shocking, this, the deadly, that. So the, what these, once again, you have these descriptors that are all aimed at something. And when, when does it become so uh, suddenly not shocking to hear these words, not wanting to make it because we become numb to it. And again, that's a case for just giving the facts. The facts are often very riveting and the, the clean, simple, short sentences can go a long way in terms of clarity and impact. So you, you just reminded me of all of that. I want to respect your time. I, before I let you go, I'd like to just ask you to, Larry, after I end the stream here on YouTube, to hang around for a couple of minutes um, off camera so we can have a quick post show. I do also want to say to the folks who are watching here live or in the replay that um, I really appreciate you taking an interest in this conversation and what we're doing here um, on Horner's Corner. Um, it's a conversation, again, aimed at sharing knowledge, points of view, and it's a conversation with respect and where we can help each other. Uh, if you have questions, you can also reach out to me um, at mark at beyond90seconds.com. If there's something I can help you with in terms of information, I'm happy to do my best to oblige. Um, I've seen that in the office hours community where people come together and I want to help people cross finish lines too. So I'm very much into that. If you want to help this channel, um, if you enjoy this conversation and you think it's worthy, please give it a like. Even I'm told more than a subscribe button, click a like goes a long ways in the YouTube algorithm. So um, I'm not against you subscribing if you find this content worthy, but please, a like goes a long way too. And lastly, if you'd like to financially support this, I recently, um, I started actually a Patreon account back in 2018 to help a creator. Um, I'm going to, I, a few days ago said, okay, I'll put, I'll put out the, the, the hand too, I guess, and say, if you'd like to support my channel, here I am. So, um, patreon.com forward slash beyond 90 seconds. You'll see the opportunities there and something that I can provide in return. If you would like to support this channel, I'll add the link beneath the, this video in the description, uh, following this live stream. Um, also, I mentioned I created the Patreon uh, page this week and already one person jumped on and I want to thank her. And that's Doreen Farrar. Doreen, I believe you're in Linwood, Washington. Um, and you've followed me on Twitter as well. So thank you very much. I really do truly appreciate your support. Larry Rice. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. I told my wife that Larry might only have 30 minutes tonight. And I told her that Larry, 30 minutes went by like that. And by the coffee, yes. by the coffee maker in the, in the weather office back in the day, she goes, you'll talk longer. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and as you'll notice, the, the lighting conditions are, are dimming down here in yeah. the uh, family room because uh, I had plenty of sunlight coming in and I didn't turn on the lights. So it's, <laughs> it's getting a little dark here. It's dark. We better make it night, turn on the lights. Okay. Hold on, Larry. I'm going to wrap up the live stream. Everybody. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your watching this broadcast and uh, have a great evening or great day, wherever you might be. And if you watch the replay and you made it this far, thank you so much. Mark Horner beyond 90 seconds here in Horner's corner until next time. Take care.